Is there anything in the early reactions to June that you've been particularly delighted by? Uh, I, uh, frankly, I, I, I'm a, the, the, the biggest challenge was to make sure that people who, 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 who will not have read the book will be able to uh, uh, will feel welcome and will be able to understand the, the story because uh, of course as the reputation of the book is uh, that it has, it's uh, dense and complex and I wanted to make sure that uh, let's say my mother will understand the, the movie without <laughs> having to read the book and and uh, which isn't very unfair for my mother because she's a brilliant uh, human being but it's it's a uh, um, um, and at the same time, uh, uh, I wanted to also to make sure that the hardcore fan of the book will uh, uh, find the qualities, the, the, the poetry, the beauty, the, 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 some of the complexity of the book, so that, to find that equilibrium. So, and so to answer your question, uh, um, it's when people come to, 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 people who haven't read the book come to me to say that they, they enjoy and understood uh, the story. It's, uh, that's for me a uh, relief. Okay. <laughs> Where do you place yourself on that continuum from casual appreciator to hardcore fan? I mean, what was your first encounter with the book? Uh, I yes, I read the book at 13 years old when uh, I was at the time uh, someone that uh, was into uh, science fiction. Uh, but, uh, I I loved reading books, science sci-fi books. I was uh, in in uh, I had an appetite to discover uh, uh, new authors at the time, and, and uh, when I, I uh, Stumble up in the book in a bookstore. Uh, uh, I was uh, very impressed by uh, the writing of Frank Herbert, and uh, I became a, a art card fan myself of, of all his novels, but more specifically of this first uh, Dune book. Yeah. Was there a particular image that formed in your mind while you were reading it at that age that you've kind of been keen to? especially keen to re recreate or realize? I will say that the presence of the Fremen in the desert, their silhouette, their uh, um, the still suit, and, uh, that, that went, the, and uh, at the end of the movie, I should spoil it, I'm, spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to make Q&A right now, and people said, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, but the, 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 the Fremen in the desert, so their presence is that they are characters that are like a, a, a native of a planet that have the ability to develop the techniques of adaptation that are quite impressive. And uh, um, that I was looking forward to bring that to the screen. And the image I, we did are pretty close to the early dreams I had when I read the book. How many people here tonight have seen it already? Because there have been a few previews. Oh, goodness. OK, ah, okay, okay spoil okay. away. It's fine. <laughs> <you know. laughs> that was a joke. Um, I think, you know, certainly for, for me, um, I knew June initially as an influence on so many other things. Like it was, it was instrumental in, I think, uh, Lucas's preparations for Star Wars, like, you know, the, from the, the desert planet to the, the, the voice becoming the force. So how did you ensure that this, this film was going to connect with people in a way that they wouldn't just see it as something they'd seen before, but it, it did feel new? But the, the, the idea that uh, it was a bit of a I don't know, fool and romantic idea, but the idea was to try to uh, go back to the source of those images that I had in my mind as a teen. As Anne Zimmer pointed out uh, in an interview recently, he said, we didn't make this this movie as adult, but as teenagers, you know, we, we went back there to this, it's an act of nostalgia, you know, what that melancholic moment, that melancholic, sorry, joy uh, that uh, we experienced as we were reading the book and, and um, uh, trying to go back to those images, I will say those uncorrupted image, image that, uh, that pure image that uh, were uh, without influence at the time. That's what uh, I try to do myself. That's the way I designed the movie uh, at the beginning. And that's what I asked my, my crew to, to stay too close to the spirit of the book and try to stay away from any other influence. But uh, of course, it's, it's not possible. We are deeply influenced by a lot of uh, preceding work. Uh, can you say that in English? Anyway, but it's, it's, uh, uh, we try to do our best to try to bring something fresh yeah, to the screen. I want to show a brief clip now that contains what I would say is, 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 is one of those images that ends on it. I mean, it's just uh, unthinkably sinister, the way this clip ends. It's only about 30 seconds, so it's not, there's no spoilers in it. But, um, but yes, this is a perfect example of what Denise was just talking about. If the Duke's son lives, now our trade is will live. My lord, you gave your word to the witch. And she sees too much. I said I would not harm them, and I shall not. But Arrakis is Arrakis. 
and the desert takes the weak. My desert. My Iraqis. My dune. I mean, one of, one of the things I love about that sequence is you could have had a supporting character pop up at some point in the film and say, oh, and by the way, Baron Harkland, played by Stan Scars out there, um, he uses these anti-gravity devices to fly around, and, you know, so that's what's going on, but you don't. And there's, there's a real kind of a, a willingness to allow the audience to meet the film on its own terms, if that makes sense. Mm. There's not any kind of desire to over-explain. You just have to kind of catch up with this world that you're putting us into. Um, can you talk us through, I mean, because it's such a clear decision all the way through the film to do that. So can you talk us through the, you know, what you see as the value of that approach? But the thing is that uh, uh, we try to create a, uh, an immersive experience that in some ways will have, uh, um, that may sound funny, but a documentary, a documentary approach to it, meaning that we will be there witnessing events at, and, and as uh, uh, if this culture that uh, we are seeing in front of us, uh, was uh, well known to everybody, like if it was uh, actually reality. And, and so it was like I was not trying to um, um, make things, uh, um, enhance, ma making them spectacular. Or I was just trying to witness the reality of those characters. And uh, so that might explain what uh, uh, you're, you're, you're talking about. Uh, what I mean, what I love about this scene is, is uh, the fact that um, uh, making this character, which is a, it's a, obviously I think that people who don't saw the movie who didn't read the book understood that he's the bad guy. <laughs> so, but in the book, the, the, the book aged very well. It, it sadly become very relevant from its thematics, uh, what it says about the world of the 20th century. It, it, it became, Frank Herbert, I think, tried to did, did a portrait of the 20th century and the main currents, and it became, it's like a prediction of what will happen in the 21st. And it's like uh, the book is slightly more relevant. So it aged very well, but some elements of it uh, uh, dated, I feel dated a little bit. And like the Baron in the book is very twisting mustache, very uh, talkative, a grotesque character, like a caricature a little bit. And uh, I wanted to bring uh, the necessary fear and threat and, and menace into him. And uh, that's why I casted Stellan Scar's guard. But also, uh, we did a tremendous amount of work on the shape of this character, so it doesn't look like a, on uh, I would say a fat baby, but more like a muscular <laughs> gorilla. You know, it's like something that I wanted to find that uh, that, uh, and we I made him more taciturn, a man of few words, uh, where we see a deep intelligence in the eyes, and um, yeah, I'm pretty uh, proud of uh, what Stellans did. Uh, it was made without a scene like that has no VFX in it. It's like. A, it's made all, 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 all on camera, meaning that the Baron is not uh, uh, still had to put a, a prosthetic suit on him. It, it, it was every morning seven to eight hours to, to get into the suit, but that allowed him to uh, have a full control of his performance, you know, and um, that is why we did it this way. It's, uh, it, I think it's really interesting that the, the BFI have framed this season around your work as, as, as about being this, this path towards this film because you're your directorial career actually began in the desert, right? I mean, uh, 32nd, uh, August 32nd on Earth, your first feature um, was, was shot partly out in the, the desert outside Utah. Um, I don't know how many people here have, have, have seen that film. It is on um, BFI Player at the moment and is, is, is really worth uh, seeking out. It's about two um, young and beautiful Montrealers, uh, Simone and Philippe, who decide to go through with this pact they made in their 20s, um, which was that if they reached a certain age and they did not have kids, they would have a kid together. And uh, Philippe, who's secretly in love with Simone, uh, decides to kind of embellish it at the last minute and say, okay, well, if we're going to do this, we, we have to do it in the desert. And so they, they, they go off to, to do just that. Um, we do have a clip of the film now that I'd love to show, um, which I think, I mean, you can almost see the DNA for, for, for June in this, in this shot, a very beautiful sequence.
plus beau moment de ma vie, Simone. C'est gentil. That's where I got the reputation to be a, a bit slow and meditative. <laughs> <laughs> it started with that shot. <laughs> what was it about the, that landscape that appealed to you from, from the very start? There was something about uh, uh, the desire to, to uh, uh, study the, those, the behavior of those characters and the blank canvas and have that uh, impact that when these landscapes bring, uh, 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 and, and they bring introspection. You know, it's, uh, the, more you do, the deeper you go into the desert, the deeper you go into yourself. And it's something that, uh, uh, that there's a link with Dune in that regard, like to this idea. And, and, uh, and uh, I wanted to, exp uh, at the time, I remember I, I was, out of film school, I, w I was like uh, fascinated by Antonioni and uh, new wave directors, and I wanted to trying to find my identity, you know. I was, but uh, um, there was something about the exploration of space and psyche that I was like trying to uh, to achieve there. I don't know. It's a, it's a, yeah. And I mean, you weren't like I feel the embarrassment. First movies. It's like teenage years. It's like seeing a picture that you of you at 16 or 14 years old. <laughs> That's me. So it's like necessarily I have a, good, a lot of affection for this movie because of the both actors that are fantastic actors. And they, they, uh, the movie follow them uh, for, for an hour and a half and I, the movie owe them everything. But uh, yeah, it's like a <laughs> teenage movie. <laughs> <laughs> but you had, I mean, you'd made films in the desert before, right? You were not just a a completely green director turning up with no idea how to operate in those conditions. You'd, you'd shot documentaries. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I had the chance to spend a bit of time in a in different desert before uh, with a camera uh, doing documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. So your next film, uh, which was released just two years later, was Maelstrom. This is one that certainly in the UK has been incredibly difficult to track down until now. Um, so if I can briefly synopsize for, for those who haven't seen it, it's, it's a morality tale, again, set in present day Montreal. Um, but a young woman who accidentally kills someone in a car accident in the dead of night, and her subsequent decisions paint her into this hair-raisingly uncomfortable ethical corner. Um, it's also narrated by a monstrous fish who appears to exist in an alternative dimension. Is that fair to say? Yeah, we could say that. Um, so <laughs> I'm kind of interested where on earth that came from, because you know, as a, as a second uh, film, you didn't feel like playing it safe at all. No, but it's it's uh, it's always strange for me. Uh, because uh, at one point I got a reputation to be a, a, a dark director that was interested in violence. And then I remember that my first two movies were actually comedies, you know. It's like it's a, a, at the time I was like a, um, trying to, uh, the movies I was doing were more light and, and, and more about trying to define my uh, identity as a filmmaker. That, that I was, so uh, maybe that... Uh, excessiveness, I don't know that, that, that came from that. But it's just that, uh, 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 yeah, nah, let's uh, watch a clip me back. I will think about what you're <laughs> okay, why, well we do. Why the fish? <laughs> we, do, we don't have a clip of the fish, uh, but we do have a, a scene that I think pairs very nicely with the uh, August 30 second scene that we, we just watched. So here's, here's a little bit of Maelstrom for you. That second feature film is a dark comedy and I think that I'm the only one who thinks it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing all the time, but I was alone. <laughs> what, what were you watching at the time? Because it, it feels, to me, it feels like it's really in that Jean-Jacques Benex, Leos Carax kind of tradition. Um, it's true that uh, uh, I was obsessed by Carax for a long uh, period of my life. Uh, at, at that time, at that time, I was really fascinated by the cinema. And the last one, three or two, uh, that, 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 the dark existential uh, exploration of of uh, yeah of extremes in in the uh, in the modern life there was something that I was like uh, uh, obsessed by at the time uh, following both women having to struggling with uh, extreme events uh, and uh, but the truth is um, uh, why I'm not talking a lot about those both both of movies they, they are kind of, as much as I have a great affection for them and they are have nice uh, poetic qualities to them but uh, I stopped making film after for several years because uh, uh, after Maelstrom, this one, uh, I uh, realized that uh, as, as I was doing it, that I had to go back to film school, that uh, I was not in control enough of um, the tool of cinema, meaning that I was not able to create images that uh, will uh, um, express in a semantic way things uh, the way I wanted. And uh, more importantly, 
I, I was feeling that I, I had not, not necessarily something interesting to say about the, and those movies were more there to uh, exist and to try to, again, find my identity, but were not very interesting for <laughs> people. I, that, that was my feeling. I mean, as a, I had a, uh, some success in film festival, but I was feeling that I was going in the wrong direction with cinema. And uh, I stopped for a while, went back to, uh, did a lot of introspection, read a lot, learn about filmmaking, and then I came back a few years later uh, uh, when I felt that I was ready to go back in. It was the best uh, decision I took. It wasn't just a few years, it was nine years. I mean, that's a long old <laughs> yeah. pause. I, 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 was, I, was, I kept saying to myself at the time that uh, being a filmmaker doesn't mean that you are necessarily making films. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about films. I was, <laughs> And, and I, uh, during that period of time, it's important to say that I wrote two screenplays, two feature films uh, uh, at the end. The, the first part, there was a three or four years of, of exploration and I, I became totally at peace with the idea that I could stop, that uh, it, uh, uh, the act of making uh, uh, movies is uh, sacred for me. There's something about it that it, it needed to uh, feel uh, um, right and, and I was uh, going in the wrong way. So that I don't want to be uh, selfish, but I, it's, uh, I need to talk about those two. So that's why I, it's diff all, still today, uh, it's difficult for me to, to watch these movies. I saw recently my Strana to approve a print and, uh, uh, and I was finally able to watch it 20 years after having finished it. You know, it's like uh, before it was too painful. It was like too, every movie uh, has the burden of uh, carrying a, 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 a certain amount of, uh, of joys victories, but a lot of, uh, of uh, failures and, and pain and anger. And sometimes uh, uh, when the, it's not, uh, the, the equilibrium is not right, it's difficult to rewatch your own work. It takes for years, you know? So uh, it's uh, like that with every movie, I feel it's like, uh, once I, I do the premiere, after that, <laughs> move forward because it's difficult, yeah. Well, look, we, we will move forward now. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the film that you came back with, Polytechnic, is, an incredibly challenging subject. I mean, you didn't make it easy for yourself on this kind of first venture back into it. Can you tell us about how you, you kind of came to decide that this, this <coughs> is the project? Because it's this kind of um, recreation of a, a mass shooting at a, a technical college in Montreal that happened in 1989. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, a really, really tough subject and, and one that's fraught with ethical challenges even just in how, you, how you're going to portray it. I totally agree. It was like, uh, um, I. Uh... I started to work on a, on a project called Incendie, which is a, 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 an exploration of war uh, uh, from uh, of the, uh, in the Middle East, and, and I, I um, an adaptation of a play from a Lebanese author. His name is Wajdi Mouawad. And at the time, as I was doing that, uh, 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 I got approached by a, a producer and, a, uh, and an actress, Karin Vanas and Maxime Riard, to they had the idea to. Uh, to make a feature film about the events of the, the, the 1989 school massacre polytechnic. That is a very horrific event. It's a, it's a, a moment where a, a killer came into a school and it, it was, I think, if, if not, uh, one of the first time, if not the first time that such a thing was happening, meaning a student coming with a gun inside a classroom. It's something that has never had happened before. And I think there had been a, a sniper once in Texas, uh, in the 70s, but something that uh, uh, horrific, and it, he was targeting only women. And and uh, it's an event that when it happened, I was uh, at the same age uh, as those students. I was at, at a university myself. And I remember the shock, the impact, the emotional shock of this, of this event, how it shook our society. Um, and um, everybody, of course, we were horrified. But I felt that inside me that something was trapped. And, and uh, uh, I remember that uh, we heard about everybody, at the point of view of everybody, police, politicians, everybody, the, the, the feminist movement, everybody talked about that, but nobody gave the, the, a voice to the students who went through this events, the people of, of my generation, the people of my age, or what, what the, the, uh, the girls and, the, and the, the young men there, the young women and young men experienced. And, and uh, I felt a, a Doom, because I said, okay, I, I, I felt that uh, it, it, it was by far the most uh, uh, um, challenging movie uh, I've done in my life. Uh, today, people come to me and said, 
and how difficult it was to do Blade Runner or how difficult it was to do uh, uh, Dune, but it, has, it is nothing to do compared to do Polytechnic, where I had, I had a, a social responsibility. I did this movie for my people, people in, in, in Montreal, people in Quebec. Uh, it's a movie that uh, uh, for me, it was like a, a way to try to find a way to, to bring a solace or some kind of comfort uh, uh, and to take care of the student that had been through this event and that had been very judged and condemned uh, at the time. And uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, um, you're right, it was like, uh, uh, morally, it was uh, uh, some decisions uh, were very delicate to take. and. Um, uh, but it was a, a very, I would say, uh, humanly rewarding experience. We did it. We did it like a, I would say, a, a, approaching like a documentary. We did a year or a year and a half of research, meeting everybody, uh, uh, and uh, that went through those events, students, uh, and to recreate the events as close as possible. And I remember that I knew everything about these events. I knew everything about the timing, each second where the killer was. I knew everything. But when it was time to recreate the the. <coughs> The, the moment I realized how uh, I put myself in a silly position, stupid position, because of course I was, everything that I was about to do would be a lie. It, it, it's not possible to recreate reality, as it, and, and then we were entering into the domain of uh, fiction. So I went for more poetry, trying to be as poetic as possible. But that w was the first time that I was feeling that I was using a camera for the right reason, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it felt uh, uh, right and it, it felt important to me. And then finally I was, feeling that I was uh, making cinema for real. There's a short scene in this a film that I think you obliquely build that whole argument in in, in, in just a, a, a really beautiful, it's, it's said without being said, so if we could show that clip now, that'd be perfect, thank you. I think the inclusion of Guernica at that point, and this is while the uh, the killer is, I mean, he's writing what we now would refer to as an incel manifesto out in the, out in the car park, but just that recognition of uh, Guernica is, is, is really powerful in that moment. Can you talk us through the, the kind of thinking behind that? Uh, it was, I think, the, the meant to be a, a reflection into the, 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 the role of the artist uh, in, uh, regarding violence and, and, and the, um, how can a, a témoin uh, testify for for uh, the brutality of, of, of the world and and uh, uh, yeah to, just trying to reflect on that I think it's like a, and a, it's a painting that uh, always deeply uh, moves me and uh, I thought it felt accurate at that moment uh, there was in the in the school at that moment they were selling posters of the paintings like that uh, when the event happened and uh, I thought that uh, this one felt uh, um, relevant to what will happen uh, uh, later as a meta reflection on the movie, I will say, I don't know, so it sounds pretentious, but uh, it's like, uh, that's uh, it felt uh, right. You mentioned that during that nine year hiatus, you also started working on a, a separate screenplay inspired by a, a play. Um, and the result was Ensendies, uh, which to me looks nothing like a play whatsoever. And I'm really interested as to how, you know, first of all, how you discovered that play and what it was about it that made you think it could be given such a, a completely cinematic treatment? I, uh, I, um, 
I was like in a in a closet for a, I don't know so that I was for a, a long period of time as you said, um, just uh, learning in different ways about the uh, um, the mechanism of humans and uh, the, the inner mechanism and also about cinema and but uh, and uh, I, I was saying to myself one day maybe I will read see hear something that would spark an idea and but I will not force it. And I went to see a play from Wes Du Mois in Montreal. Uh, um, it was the last night. I got two tickets for me and my wife, and we were sitting in the front row. And it it was a, it was a three hours and a half play without on track, and it, it it was like uh, and it started with that long speech. And I said, Oh my God, it's going to be unbearable. <laughs> and uh, I I remember uh, uh, that those three hours and a half went like that, that there was no more oxygen in the room as it was so intense and all. Uh, the un the, the un the, all, we all the audience went out on the sidewalks walking our on our knees you know it was so powerful one of the most powerful uh, theatrical event I, uh, theater event sorry play, uh, most powerful play I've seen like a kind of a Greek inspired by Greek tragedies you know it's, it's super uh, about uh, uh, the story of a, of a, of a woman uh, that went through the the what was like a, a, a fictional Lebanese war. I say that Liba Lebanon is not mentioned, but the, it, all the elements refer to the, the Lebanese uh, conflict. And uh, I remember being there, totally moved, and uh, my wife telling me, "Oh, you're gonna make a movie again." She said that spontaneously, and and I took my my all my guts, and I went to see the author, Wajim Mawad, and I uh, asked him for the rights, and he was deeply moved, uh, uh, and he said to me two things. He said. He had just made a feature film himself about one of his plays, and he said to me, I think you're a fool. It's, a, it's not possible to translate that into a movie. But I'm, I, it's so mad that I'm moved by you. <laughs> and, and, and he gave me the rights. I mean, he, he allowed me to try. And, and uh, it took me years to translate his play into a, um, into a film. Uh, uh, his play is made of long monologues. Uh, um, and I had to. I wanted to make it as cinematic as possible. It took me a long time. I was not alone to do this work. I was helped by a friend, Valérie Beaugrand Champagne, that helped me to write the screenplay. We were two. But it was uh, uh, still to this day is one of the uh, the greatest source material I've ever, ever worked with. I think it's like it's uh, the play is a masterpiece. That I can say it's like a really impressive, and, and it was a privilege for me to to bring that to the screen. Yeah. I mean, the, the size of the canvas that you're working on with Ansonti is so much bigger than, than anything you'd attempted before. Did it feel like operationally you were kind of taking this big, big step up? Because, you know, you, plots ranging across decades, you've got characters traveling the world. It's, it's, it's a huge, huge story. Yeah, but I've, I, it, I always try to um, pick up projects that I feel that are on my reach. You know, it's, at that time, I felt I was technically ready to do it. That's why I, um, yeah. All this 30 second on Earth revolved around a couple, but then your next three films all have female heroes. And we'll, we'll, we'll go on to, to talk about in, in Sicario and Arrival. I think there's a lot of times in cinema, particularly in, in genre cinema, where it kind of seems to default to a male lead. And I was wondering what it was at that early stage in your career that that drew you towards uh, stories with, with female protagonists, if there was something particularly uh, interesting or you know, a particular quality you thought that brought to the world. It's, it's um, at the beginning, it, it, it when I wrote that August 32nd on Earth, it was very spontaneous to, for me to write for a woman. And I was surprised uh, at, at the time when I, I decided to. And I, I didn't question it, uh, but I, I was like, uh, it was where the inspiration was, was, uh, um, was where I was heading and where, where I was um, pulled by the inspiration in that direction to write for a woman. And uh, of course, uh, so maybe uh, I was uh, at the time uh, uh, Ray, I, I was in deep love with the, the work of Bergman. I, not that I'm, I'm coming, but I'm just saying. I say you would try to, imagine. but the the truth is is that uh, um, I think that uh, the femininity. I I, I I I have always been deeply inspired by by femininity, by by uh, 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 the relationship of women with power, and and it's uh, something that um, comes from. I was uh, raised by a, a mother that was a uh, uh, pretty uh, feminist and, 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 and also by two incredibly 
um, powerful grandmothers that uh, uh, that are incredible characters. You know, they are very opposite and, and very present in my my early life. Very present. I, I was really raised by women, and 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 uh, it opened the. Um, I think that a lot of my um, sensibility comes from them, and I think that it's out question inspiration. You know, it's like a, it's, it's just that it was a natural. I, all the projects that I was choosing, all the things that were coming to me, Polytechnic, Incendie, at, at were were a, a project about femininity, and it, it then it it it, it just uh, went on like that. It's it's just a natural. Uh, I love women. I, I'm fascinated by. Uh, by several uh, facets of, of, of femininity, and, uh, and as that explains this, I think uh, it's not a very interesting uh, uh, answer, but that's the truth. <laughs> and Sondi's is it's dedicated to our grandmothers, right? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I mean, that film became enormous. It was it was nominated for an Oscar, and it kind of became what's called a like a calling card film. Did it feel like you were sort of making this as a a, a, a big showcase to Hollywood, and, and and tell us about how it even became that, because it was it was directly through this film that you you went on to. Yeah, to no, but it was not. I I, I I was not dreaming to come to to go to Hollywood. I was not. Uh, uh, for me, I was like I didn't want to uh, be a. Uh, uh, I didn't want to make the, the seven. Uh, I mean, legally blonde seven. Or what, I didn't want to. <laughs> to, to uh, I would love to see. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but not, not no disrespect for legally blonde, but I just I, I didn't want to. to uh, and and there, there are tons of great directors there. And I knew that I didn't want to line up uh, uh, being in the back of a line of 5,000 directors that are trying to. Uh, and and uh, in uh, Quebec, uh, we, have, we don't have a lot of money. We have, we have total freedom. And that has uh, no price uh, for me. That, that, that no, um, I wanted to, to keep that. And I, I wanted, uh, I was interested to work abroad, uh, to work with. Uh, Filmmakers from other other cultures that uh, was really appealing. I was I was thinking to myself, it would be nice to work in in Europe, in England, or, or maybe uh, uh, in the English Canada, which is a foreign country. And and uh, 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 so I was I was really surprised uh, when uh, uh, we got nominated at at Academy Awards, and my work has had, had already already had attracted some uh, uh, attention um, in Hollywood with Polytechnic. That's where I got an agent. Uh, uh, asking to represent me, uh, it, it was Polytechnic that went to Cannes Film Festival, and then uh, I, I got representation in U.S. And when I, 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 I uh, was, re I got representation. In my mind, it was, it would be useful if ever I want to approach actors, British actors or, or American actors, if ever I have something that would be interesting. But I never thought that myself I, I would work there, and it's just that uh, they, uh, they sent me a, a screenplay. Uh, and it was one of the very first screenplay of uh, 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 many of them, but the very f one of the very very first one of uh, well, or the first one were call was called Prisoners, and I was struck by the the amount of uh, rec uh, similarity about the themes that I was trying to explore with Ensandi, and it felt like a continuity, a natural continuity, and and. Uh, but it was very violent, very dark. And I said, uh, uh, coming out of Polytechnic and Essence, I said, OK, I have enough. I put the, that screenplay aside, and I tried to work on something else. But the idea always came back. So that's where I'm, uh, I said, where the inspiration come from? So that's why I said some, sometimes I'm, I have more the impression that the projects are choosing me, and less, less the opposite. It's like I felt more and more obsessed by, by uh, prisoners. And then I was invited to do for the first time in my life, and the only time, a pitch to a, a, a film studio. So you sit in a room where in a, uh, on a, there's a table, and then there's a, so many people that your eyes has, needs to pan to. to. <laughs> and and uh, I said to myself, I will do it, because it's going to be a beautiful cultural experience. <laughs> to finally see the famous executive, you know, <laughs> to see the, the, the people that are, everybody are afraid of. And I said, it's going to be it's going to be fun to fly to Los Angeles to, to meet. And, and I, I, the truth, I, I think I got the movie because I had nothing to lose. I, I, I was not trying to get it. I just told them the truth <laughs> <laughs> about what I deeply love about the project and what I thought was a, a messy and what had to be changed. And, what, and, and I was, I think, so confident because I was convinced that I will not get it, <laughs> that, that uh, uh, it happened, that it, uh, I, you know, I think it's like uh, 
very often we hear actors uh, talk, talking about that they go in the audition and they because they are relaxed they, they give a good audition but if they are stressed out then uh, so i was i think it's just i was lucky was there an aspect of prisoners that you felt was peculiarly american because i mean the scale of the story you could almost you could make something along those lines in quebec yeah um this idea that there was, I think, but, but that could be a, a Canadian tool, but there was something about the presence of religion in the story that I felt was uh, something that I was feeling very American. And and uh, this idea of survivalist, surv uh, survivalism, survivalism, yeah. Thank you. Uh, 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 <laughs> felt something, it was like uh, uh, that, that kind of paranoia toward the institutions. Yeah, that was very American. That kind of paranoia regarding institution. It, it, now we, I think it's it, it start to we we start to have the same thing in in Canada. But at that time, it was something that was more American than Canadian. I will say yeah. that felt American. And you made Prisoners around the same time you made Enemy. I mean, both films were released in in twenty thirteen. Both films also started. The, 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 but how did <coughs> that kind of weave together? I. Um, I had another project that I wanted to do with a friend of mine, Nick Fitchman in Toronto, and it was a, 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 a tiny movie. The, uh, I was feeling at the time that uh, I, had, I was able to build beautiful relationships with the cinematographer, with the editor, with the composer, with all the film crew member. I felt like we were bonding together. But the actors, uh, they were coming on set. Uh, uh, I was feeling always that there was something uh, awkward with my way of directing, and I, I was not feeling close enough. I, I, and I, I, I was feeling I was not sharing creativity enough with them, and I wanted to demystify the beast, you know. So I created Enemy, which is technically a laboratory where I would spend forty days with an actor, being alone with him, and experiment, experiment, experiment. And Jake Gyllenhaal loved the idea, and 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 and, and uh, decided to do it. It was a, a very uh, an adaptation of Jose Saramago's novel called The Double. And, uh, um, but at the time, had simultaneously, uh, uh, Prisoner had been greenlit at the same time. So uh, we, we, I had to convince uh, the studio, the American studio, to wait so I could make that experimental film, which they didn't like the idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, but that was the, the honestly, I can say that was a genius idea to do an enemy before prisoners. First of all, to to work for the very first time in English. I mean, to 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 make sure that I would be able to have the necessary vocabulary to be able to communicate with an actor, to demystify the, the work with a, a, a foreign actor, like other with the actor, to to um, learn more about the language too. So it was a, a, a enemy in a way was a fantastic boot camp about acting. And, and what I learned during this movie had a tremendous impact on everything I've done after. And, and uh, Jake and I loved uh, so much the experience that uh, uh, he agreed to come on board with Hugh Jackman on, on Prisoners. And uh, um, it was uh, for me Prisoners, and at the time I thought it would be my only American film, uh, was an amazing experience because I had the chance to work with uh, artists uh, that I, I that I I never thought I would have the, the privilege to work with like the great Roger Deakins you know who who, who uh, uh, accepted to to do the cinematography on the movie and that for me was like one of my biggest dream to work with a master like a, 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 a and to work with Roger was like it was for me I, could, I a prisoner could have been my last film and I would have said thank you to the gods of cinema and it's, <laughs> I was like so happy you know it's like uh, uh, and. Again, when you work with a master like that, every shot is a, is a master class. And, and I, I, Roger Deakins is known to, to be a, a master of light, but more importantly, he's it's a fantastic, it's fantastic storyteller. I learned so much about camera work, working with him. Yeah, insane. What was it about his style that you that clicked so well with your own? Because the two of you now, I think, in everyone's minds here, you know, you <coughs> do go together so perfectly. I, I think that it, it's, uh, first of all, for me, to be honest, it was very awkward. The idea that Roger wanted to work with me—it's it's like, like, uh, and 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 we are very different. So yes, often I make the joke that it's like if a lobster and a goat wants to work together, and and, and by miracle it works. I mean, I don't know how we could, but it's just that we are different. But when it it comes time to work with the camera, 
there's something about the singularity trying to find the best point of view and trying to shoot as less as possible. This, that's kind of a, a, a trying to find a, a, a very, how can I say, methodic Zen approach about camera work and, and, and uh, minimalism about camera work that uh, uh, we both connected deeply. Uh, 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 I'd started to do this approach doing SLD, where I finally, I was feeling that I was at home working like that. It was less flashy, it was less spectacular, it was out of fashion to work like that, but for me, at the time everybody were doing an L and about that. And, and I, I, was, I just felt that I was, uh, at the, that, that, that was me. That I, and when uh, uh, Roger saw Insanzi, uh, uh, he was the one who approached me to, to work on prisoner, which was totally surreal for me. To, to, and uh, um, he just, it was just an ex not an extension, that sounds super pretentious, but I would say we were just walking in the same direction and we got along uh, very well working. On that point about finding that minimalistic visual style, I want to show a clip from uh, actually from Enemy. Um, which I just, it's, it's, I, I love this scene. Um, we're, we're generally the, the, the premise of Enemy, right? We have Jake John Hall playing two people, the history professor and the, the jobbing actor, who's, who look physically identical and, and their lives uh, happen to kind of become intertwined. Um, this is a, a, a terrific scene. If you've not seen the film, it probably won't mean a great deal, but I love it so much we had to show it. Um, so, so here it is. Out of context, this scene must be feel weird, but there's a lot of things happening. <laughs> <laughs>
And I think that uh, uh, Sarah Gaydon, the actress, who is a fantastic actress, uh, in that moment when I was, she was doing that performance here, which is super subtle, and there are so many layers on what she's she's accomplishing in this scene. I deeply love working with her. She's a, a Canadian actress that I, uh, I'm, I hope I will have the chance to work with her again because that's the genius of that good acting. You know, the, when the I remember how excited I was when I was shooting this scene because it, she had to do so many details in order for the scene to work. It's like, but out of context, that must be strange. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're, we're getting to the, the enormous stuff now. Um, next up, I want to talk about Sicario and Arrival, both of which felt like really prescient films to me in, in the months after I saw them. You know, Sicario is about how America defines itself by its borders, its kind of self-image. It's, it's about who they're not as well as who they are. Um, and then obviously a year after that came out, that became a massive kind of political talking point over there. Uh, and then Arrival, you know, this film about communication, the, the, the beauty of understanding things from different perspectives. Uh, you have the election of Trump, you have Brexit, and you have countries kind of around the world closing in on themselves. Um, so I'm really interested if when you're making those, and I, again, you know, e even uh, from, from Prisoners, these are big step up movies. Did they feel like um, they were they were kind of tapping into something that was that was out there in the world at the time? I think that uh, you cannot choose project like that. I think that uh, it's like uh, intuition that drives you towards some uh, uh, ideas or some subject. I was like at the time very fascinated by what was happening at, at, in the at the border the, uh, uh, between United States and Mexico. How meaningful. Uh, that part and, and painful, but so meaningful what is happening there. And, and, and uh, I thought it was saying a lot of things about uh, the Eastern, the Western world and about uh, North America, most, more specifically, but uh, about uh, uh, so many things about uh, our societies. And, and, and uh, um, I uh, had the chance to find that screenplay written by Taylor Sheridan, uh, who is a master uh, 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 and I just uh, got the. It was the Sicario was the the movie I, I I put on track the fastest in my life. It was a matter of weeks, which I chose a project at the time. Prisoner had been a, a beautiful success, a critic critical hit, and but also at the box office. So when I, it was very easy to put the Sicario on track. I mean, it could, took some weeks, and a few months later, we were in the desert with Roger and shooting at the border with Benicio del Toro, Emily Blunt, and Josh Brolin, and. Um, it, it is one of the nice uh, cinematic experience that I had because uh, uh, there was something about uh, the, it was yeah a really uh, cinematic uh, screenplay. Uh, I'm, I'm still uh, yeah I, I was very lucky to to have the chance to adapt this one. And on arrival, I only read the Ted Chiang short story that it was based on after having seen the film. Nothing about that story screams adapt me into a film. I mean, it looks unadaptable. I don't know if, if anyone here has read this story, but it's it, it just, you know, the, the way it plays with tense and your kind of assumptions about how, yeah. but, but you read it and you, and, and you, you were keen to adapt it straight away. No, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I at the time when uh, I was doing Prisoners and when I finished Prisoners, uh, everybody in, uh, were asking, okay, what do we want to do? What, 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 what would, would be your dream project? And I, I kept saying uh, science fiction, thinking of Dune seriously, but, but I wanted to do science fiction and, and, uh, to producer uh, Dan Cohen and Dan Levine uh, said, have you read that short story of Ted Chiang called The Story of Your Life, which is a gem. I strongly recommend if you can read it. It's absolutely fantastic. One of the best pieces of, of writing. Uh, uh, but uh, I read it and I said, guys, it's super inspiring. I love language. I love the, the, this, this. I think it's a genius idea to to approach uh, uh, the visit of extraterrestrial link with understanding them that the main thing is about language and 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 uh, but I, it as you rightly said i said i can i don't know how to have it's so intellectual the, the how can you i was uh, and and then um, so I, I left went to do sicario and and, uh, and they came back with a screenplay written by, by eric Eisert, who had cracked cracked it had found a way in its way into a, a, a really uh, a great writer than he and uh, so him having found the, found the key to open the, the adaptation, I, I uh, started to work with Eric and, and we uh, uh, finalized the screenplay together and, and it became Arrival. Did the success, I mean, Arrival was, was huge. It was, it was really successful as, as well as being this incredibly smart, thoughtful film. It, it connected with a huge audience. Did, did the success of that convince you that um, 
something as ambitious as Blade Runner 2049 could work. Because, I mean, I, to, to, to <coughs> me, the thought of having to follow Blade Runner is as every bit as daunting as having to, to adapt you. I, I um, still, I'm, 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 I'm very happy about the experience of doing Blade Runner 2049. I still think it's, it was the worst best idea to, 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 to <laughs> do a sequel to a masterpiece. It's a, a sacrilegious territory, uh, as a friend of mine said. You don't walk there, okay? You don't you do not do a sequel to Blade Runner. I mean, it's like if someone was coming tonight and uh, offering me this, I would say, please don't do that. So it's like, it's like, uh, uh, if I had to do it, I would do it again, but I would, <laughs> but I'm sincere. I mean, I think it's like, it was, it's just that Blade Runner was offered to me as I was shooting Sicario before arrival. I, I um, it's just that uh, uh, Ridley Scott is well known to cook a lot of projects at the same time, and he, he, time was running out. Harrison Ford wanted to shoot, and and uh, Ridley was not available, and uh, so they started to look for somebody else, and they came to me, which is surreal. That uh, I had a secret meeting in the middle of the desert uh, uh, by the border with a producer who insisted that nobody uh, see us. And he gave me an envelope, uh, uh, and, and it was written uh, Queen, uh, yeah, Queensboro on, on the envelope, and he said, "This Queensboro doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a it's a project. It's Blade. That's the new Blade Runner movie." And honestly, I was deeply moved to tears just to have the chance to read the screenplay because I knew at the time those producers were friends, and I knew that they were wor working on this crazy idea. Ridley was. Working, I had seen artwork. I had seen things in their office. I was speaking sometime, going, and it was. It, I was so excited at the idea that it will go on with this universe, and with it. And uh, and, um, and uh, I uh, I um, I remember the truth that I declined at one point because I, I thought it was like uh, too dangerous. But then uh, after a while, we had talked again, and I accepted to to do it, and and uh, it was uh, very powerful and rewarding experience uh, to, to do to do this project but uh, yeah <laughs> you don't do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we have unfortunately run out of time but before we end I just want to show one uh, more brief clip from June just to bring us back to where we started which is with uh, two preposterously attractive actors in the middle of the desert so here we have one more protection from June. I don't believe you're the Lisan al Gahib. But I want you to die with honor. This Chris knife was given to me by my great aunt. It's made from a tooth of Shai Halud, the great sandworm. This will be a great honor for you to die holding it. Where's the outworlder? Jonas is a good fighter. He won't let you suffer. 